as our guest lecturer. And uh, before I start, uh, I think I need uh, Busara help me to give a screenshot or capturing uh, our attendance here. So before I share uh, my uh, introduction screen. Okay, we'll then do a rematch then. We will have, we have Okay, so uh, let me share my screen first. Okay. <clears throat> so uh, good morning again, everyone. Uh, I'm sure that uh, there are still a lot of uh, participants uh, entering this meeting, but I want to start uh, early this morning. So we have a topic about stress, trauma, and the effect of on memory. Uh, Dr. Dakopek, actually, we, uh, for the last two weeks, we have already discussed about uh, memory, stress, and trauma. Uh, and also, uh, we have some reading assignment for students, for our students. So I hope uh, today we, we will have more uh, enlightenment from your side because uh, we use uh, of your books, I think, uh, no, two, uh, two of your books, Environmental Psychology for the Sign, uh, from the first edition and from the last edition in 2018, I believe. So before, before I start, um, I would like to introduce our team teaching and also our class member, Dakopek, because uh, as our previous discussion, uh, well, now we are online, so I think it's better that you know our students. We have 24 students uh, right now. So this is our team teaching, uh, the Dr. Uh, we have uh, me as uh, coordinators, and we also have Bunufi and Sarah and Setio. But uh, right now this year, uh, Setio have to leave for his doctorate degree in Japan. But thank you very much, uh, Pastor Teo. Uh, you are coming, uh, although you now you are in Japan. We have, uh, I think, three hours behind, right? From Japan. And, yeah. and we also have uh, some our seniors here and also uh, our lecturer. And uh, we also have uh, some students, not only from postgraduates uh, from undergraduate students because this class is for uh, undergraduate students, uh, architecture and behavior, or we call it in Indonesia, Aspektur Pilaku. We, we, uh, we, we have this class uh, since 2018, so this, this subject is quite new uh, in our department. And the next is our class members. Uh, so here we have uh, 24 students, but usually we have 25 students uh, maximum. So we have uh, Meli, Eza, Mercy, Melanie, Iza, Bita, Ilin, Piwi. And also we have uh, Elsa, Yuni, Denok, Ara, Tania, Novisa, Saras, Reza. And lastly, uh, we have Icha, Indi, Tessa, Yuta, Alifa, Natifa, BC, and Givari. So uh, before um, your lecture, uh, I would like, uh, please allow me to have a quick uh, CV for Dr. Dakopek. So Dr. Dakopek, uh, uh, Associate Professor in the School of Architecture at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. Uh, he's an architectural psychologist and he has educational background in health science, psychology, and architecture. And I think uh, we already know that uh, he authored several books. And this is the books that we use in uh, our uh, 
class, uh, not only in undergraduate uh, program, but also in postgraduate programs. So we have here three edition of environmental psychology for the science. And uh, I believe that we use the first edition and also the last edition in 2018, I think. And also we uh, use the Rutledge Convenient for Architecture, Design and Practice in our theoretical architecture subject. And I think lastly, you have a uh, new books here, yeah, uh, Dr. Dr. Kopek in 2021, about person-centered healthcare design. And, uh, <laughs> and Dr. Dr. Kopek, uh, you has a two-time Portuguese uh, prize winner and have been awarded Nori uh, Fellowship to a SID. So I think that's a quick uh, CV from uh, Dr. Dakopek. So I think uh, without further ado, I would like to invite Dr. Dakopek uh, for giving uh, your lecture. So time is yours, uh, Dr. Excellent. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you for that, that great introduction. It's wonderful to see your, your team. And I really appreciate all of you guys who are here at seven o'clock in the morning. And uh, is somebody here at four o'clock in the morning? Is, is that what uh, I heard? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> appreciative to uh, to be invited to, to speak with you guys. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and uh, we can go from there. Okay. And um, I think somebody can can invite the people that are coming in, right? Okay. Beautiful. So today I want to talk to you a little bit about stress, trauma, and memory. And I think this is a very opportune time uh, to be talking about some of these things considering what we've all been going through throughout the planet with this COVID-19 lockdown. And there are many people that are experiencing high levels of stress because they are trying to negotiate their workplace environment as well as their family obligations. And then there's a lot of people who are living with a lot of fear, uh, fear of the virus itself, fear of the vaccines, and this fear is, is somewhat traumatizing for them. And it's affecting the way that, that we learn, it's the, affecting the way that, that we remember things. And memory is, is a very important aspect as we think about navigating our urban environment or navigating some of our larger buildings and structures. And so how, how does that all come together in a, in a very symbiotic kind of relationship? So um, the first thing that we're gonna go ahead and do is, oh, wait a minute here. Okay, so who gets affected by this? Well, the bottom line is, is that we're all affected by stress. Um, our children are affected by it. Uh, adults are affected by it. And uh, older people are also affected by it. They're affected in different ways. So we need to be aware of how it is that those people are being, are being affected. So the first thing that we do, and, and this is a part that, that is very important to me and kind of near and dear to me, and that is understanding who it is that we're designing for. What is the purpose of design? I think that one of my biggest pet peeves or one of the things that drives me crazy is being brought into a thesis or a dissertation or even a design project after everything's been done. And I have to back into the problem solving. Whereas what I'd like to do is propose that we start looking before we even start designing. We look at who it is that we're designing for. Are they children? Are they adolescents, adults? Are they elderly people? Because each one of these groups perceives and understands the environment differently. And when they perceive and understand it differently, that means that also the way that stimuli affects them is gonna be different. 
men and women also uh, experience the world differently. And then there are culture and religious backgrounds that will be a mediator. So it'll come into effect in the way that we're going to experience that environment. Now for us today, we're gonna to be talking about stress and trauma and then that relationship to, to memory. Now, part of this is gonna take a look at, at the climate. What is the relationship between the climate that we have, um, some of the customs and the laws, and then what is the outcome goal? What is it that we wanna do? And part of this gets determined by determining what is it that our building is? Is it a public building? Is it a private building? Or is it semi-private? And once we determine all of that, then we kind of have our, our, our big pot of variables that we can start to use in the design process itself. So as we start to, to look at some of this stuff, we have to first realize that trauma results from stress. Bottom line, if you're under a lot of stress, you can start to experience the effects of trauma. Now that could be over, overstimulation or understimulation. Stress then has an effect on memory and the way that we, we recall things. So there's this reciprocal relationship between trauma, stress, and memory that is all linked together within a, a, a chain of events, if you will. So as we start to look at that, there are some foundational topics that we have to think about, and that is our neurochemicals. And then there's also some hormones. But I'm only going to talk about neurochemicals right now because neurochemicals are all about the body having homeostasis. We have to have balance. When we're out of balance, then, the, then we will start to secrete or absorb certain neurochemicals. One of the ones that we see right now is serotonin. Serotonin is, is regulated through full spectrum sunlight. And since we're spending so much time inside of the built environment, and since we're also spending so much time with different sunscreens or uh, lotions that we're not allowing the full spectrum sunlight to, to enter into our body, which is decreasing our levels of serotonin. And that's bringing about chronic depression or anxiety. So that becomes something that, 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 that's important to understand. Trauma affects our oxytocin, which is our bonding. How is it that we can bond with another person? Do we bond with our mom or our dad or our siblings? Uh, glutamate is responsible for learning and memory. So one of the big hints that I had when I was in college is if there was a big exam, eat a Snickers bar before your exam because glutamate helps you with the recall and learning and the memory. If you have diabetes, please don't do that. But uh, that might be one way that you can look at things. GABA is related to, to calming. Cortisol, we've talked a lot about cortisol in the media lately about its relationship to stress. And when we get stressed out, we start to secrete more cortisol. Cortisol then impedes our ability to utilize carbohydrates. And so we tend to gain weight from that. And dopamine is related to motivation. So are we motivated to learn or would we rather clean the toilet? What is it that we want to do? Uh, endorphins are the feel goods and then norepinephrine also called adrenaline. This is an important one because when people get stressed out, they can experience an adrenaline surge. When somebody's in an adrenaline surge, they're completely irrational and we can't even pretend to let them be rational. We have to let them burn that off some way, somehow. So you'll hear me talk a little bit about that as we move forward. So moving forward from there. So now we understand that we have all these neurochemicals that are happening. And when we're stressed out, there's this balance and stuff that goes on within the body as the body tries to regulate. And so you start to see things going up and down as we try to strive for homeostasis. Now, the next area that we have to look at is the relationship between our sensory input. And that comes from sight, sound, touch, smell, and taste. Now, most of us don't eat the built environment. I'm assuming you aren't gnawing on your doors or your window frames. 
Um, so really, when we look at design, we're really only looking at sight, touch, um, smell, and hearing. And let's just put this in perspective. Let's just imagine that we're trying to, to study some equations or we're trying to learn about structures, but the latrine or the, the um, bathroom is extremely smelly. Are we gonna be able to concentrate on what we're learning in this highly technical or formulaic when we've got such a horrible smell? Probably not. So that's a variable that comes into play. Now, I use this image over here um, with all the clocks because I, I pretend that this is a scale of one to 10. And so these are all the different variables that affect us as we're going through our learning and our, and our um, memory. So we might be hyperstimulated, where we're overstimulated or hypostimulated, depending on the environment and the expectations. So if you're going to a nightclub, you're expecting a high level of stimulation. And so you can be easily hypostimulated within that environment and feel a little stressed out, and then you're going to leave. And then you can go into an environment like a library or a classroom, and you can be overstimulated and you can be hyperstimulated. So understanding this relationship as we start looking at sight, sound, touch, smell, and taste, and how does that rank within expectations and cultural and behavioral norms becomes part of the puzzle itself that we're putting together. Because in essence, when we're designing a building and we're designing the interiors, we're really putting together a puzzle based off of the end users. So that brings us into our Gestalt. So Gestalt, the fundamental premise of Gestalt is that the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. So we have seven basic laws, they're actually really five, but they've expanded it to, to seven basic laws. And the first one is proximity. And that is when things are close together, they appear related. They may not be related. You might have something like milk next to Coca-Cola, and you might think, oh, well, they go together because of their proximity, but they really don't go together. That's what proximity does. And so we start to look at, at buildings, and we start to say, hmm, should we be having a prison close to a school? Or what does it say when we have the police headquarters next to a school. What's the relationship? And that's what we have to start to ask ourselves. And that's where the law of similarity starts to come in because when things appear to be similar to each other, we'll start to group them together. So maybe if there's a police academy next to a school, then it's a natural logical progression to move into law enforcement. The next one is the law of closure. And this is when your brain closes in the gaps. So I'm sure you've all been aware of rumors and how rumors get started. They usually get started because somebody leaves out a vital detail and they say, well, that's private and I can't tell you. The natural reaction for the brain is to fill in the gap. And so whether or not that gap is true or not is not really, not really relevant. It just matters what the person is believing. The next one is common fate. And this is when things are moving in the same direction or doing something similar, they act like they belong together. So what is the relationship between them? Obviously a law office and a police station work and act together but does a law office and a hospital act together? So is there proximity together? This is where we start looking at our sites and we look at the site analysis to say, how is it that we can, can develop this, this space in a more cohesive way that makes sense? Then we start looking at symmetry. And symmetry is when we start to look at how things are clustered together as as bookends, male, female is a symmetry, even though two men would be the absolute symmetry, but in our minds, we look at the male, female as the symmetry. The next one is continuity. And this is when we start to have these lines 
that come together. And we tend to look at straight lines and curve lines as belonging to one another. And then our last one is the common region. It's in the theater district, it's in the financial district, and that's what the common region is all about. So what happens is that we get all the sensory data and we say to ourselves, here's the, the rumble of a car's engine. We know the difference between the rumble of a car's engine for a muscle car versus say a truck or a motorcycle. So we're trying to bring them together. And then we hear this rumble of an engine and then we see a small little Fiat or Volkswagen bug come out. That violates our notion. And so we're going to pay attention to it. Now, Hollywood uses that all the time because it's funny. But when we're, when we're doing things in design, that type of surprise can be disturbing and it could have a negative effect on, on people. One of my former students wanted to design a, um, a museum. And so he understood this, this stacking relationship between driving to the museum as that being the first level that's going to, in, that's going to determine perception. If they've had a terrible drive to the museum, once they go in, they're going to be in a bad mood and they're going to start to perceive things more negatively. And then if they have to wait in line, if the, if the cost is higher than what they expect, those are all variables that are then going to lead to the perception of the museum. So his idea was to create a dark space. A person would go into the museum. It would be devoid of light for a period of time, devoid of sound, devoid of smell, and um, the temperature in there would be, would be not too hot and not too cold. So the idea was to cleanse the palate so that when somebody went, left that room and entered the museum space, they would be entering the museum space from a level of purity that most museums are not entered into. Now that was his, his theoretical framework. Could you do it? I don't know. You know, in practice, it may not work out so well. But this sensory data is not equally distributed. And so again, we look at, at our sight, sound, touch, smell, and taste. And here we have a healthy person that is putting them all together in a nice gestalt way. The whole is greater than the sum of its parts. And these are all the pieces of the puzzle. This person's having problems. So he may be over-focusing on sound and under-focusing on vision. And so you end up with a missing puzzle piece here. That leads to a distortion in the memory formation. And that could either lead to the memory being recalled incorrectly or the memory itself being completely false, the false memory being developed. So again, we come into the nightclub and we think to ourselves, okay, we're in a nightclub here. What do we expect? In a nightclub, you're going to number one, expect loud sounds. So here we're going to have this expectation that this area is going to be much higher. It's going to be followed by, by the sight. Now, the third area of this one here is likely to be touch because this is one of the few environments where people will not mind being touched by another person. But if you were in some other environment, it would be a violation of somebody's personal space. So we start to look at that and then you start to say, okay, what would happen if, if I had no vision in here, all I had was, was the sound? Would I still have the same experience? What would happen if I had the vision, but there was no sound? What would the experience be like? And then of course there's the smell. I mean, as you can see, people are dancing with their arms up in the air and well, you know, they're dancing. So there's gonna be some aromas that are going in there. So we start to look at this and we say to ourselves, how is it that we can measure that and to make sure that this happens? Um, it meets expectations because when it meets expectations then we're gonna have the experience and we're gonna have the positive memories. 
But then you take a look at a situation like this, where a person is in their automobile and they're feeling that they're overstimulated or they're, they're very frustrated. And this is where stimulation and overload theories come into play, because clearly in this type of an environment, we can tolerate a whole lot more. This one, a lot less, and it's gonna be even less theoretically in a, in a library. So we start to say to ourselves, and car makers do this all the time, luxury car makers in particular, because they want to try to keep you calm knowing that we're going to have traffic and we're going to have gridlock that we that every place seems to have these days. So are you getting direct sunlight because you're driving west or you're driving east and the sun is blinding you and you can barely see? Is that going to lead to your frustration? What about learning? What if you learn from the news back in a long time ago? I'm not gonna well, I'll go ahead and date myself. Um, in the late 80s, San Francisco had that major earthquake in which the freeways collapsed on top of each other. Right after that, there was a lot of stress and you would see a lot of aggression with people who were stuck on the freeway and they were stuck underneath those overpasses. They were stressed out because they were experiencing a form of PTSD because they were afraid that an earthquake was going to happen and that the freeway would collapse on top of them. So you would see them inching forward or keeping a lot of distance between them and the other car so that they could avoid not being underneath that overpass. That's an example of where we learn something from, from the media. And this is where, where I was talking about with the COVID aspect, because we know they've changed things around. And then, you know, media in, in at least in the United States tends to be very dramatic. And so people become very afraid of the COVID. Well, then all of a sudden they see people who aren't wearing a mask and they, they get stressed out and they go and they confront that person like, why aren't you wearing a mask? You know, you should be, be doing something. It's because they're stressed out and they're experiencing trauma because of what they've, they've heard on television or read on the internet or, or what have you. But there's a direct relationship to those behaviors. And so we're starting to see right now, at least here in the United States, and I suspect in other places, we're starting to see that relationship to, to the stress and the, the trauma that's being evoked from that. So as we start looking at the different forms of trauma, we have to say, well, okay, where is it coming from and what does it mean? So here you've got the lone shooter. You see somebody carrying a gun. What is that going to do? Well, if you've got a lone shooter and you're looking at the trauma, it's going to be those pop, pop, pops that, that are coming. Uh, it may be that, that you'll see some sparks from that. Um, and so when you see somebody walking like this, what are you going to do? Are you going to get fear-based paralysis or are you going to be running or or are you just so used to seeing somebody walking down the street with a gun that you just don't do anything? You're just like, oh yeah, yeah that's just, that'll probably be another shooting and it'll be on the news later on today. You know, where does, where do you fall into that spectrum? Here you can see a kid who is obviously dealing with trauma from school. And there's been a lot of research recently about young men uh, within, within the educational system and how they're dropping out because we're not teaching to the way that, that boys learn and we're not putting resources into that. And so is this kid going to develop test anxiety and the notion that they're gonna have to take a test causes trauma because of a past experience? Do they then give up, which is learned helplessness or are they able to move forward? What is the situation with that? And is there another way that the kid can learn? Here you have spousal abuse. So what are you going to do and, and how do you handle it? In most cultures, it's inappropriate for a guy to hit a girl. So now you've got this girl coming at you with a wine glass in the, in the air. You can't really defend yourself because culture says that men don't hit, don't hit women. How do you handle the situation and what does it mean? Now, later on, is he going to focus in on the wine glass? Because that's what she came after him with, was the wine glass. That could be 
the variable that gets exploded. Uh, here, you've got child abuse. Now here, the mother is holding the child. Now think about the recollection here. My mother had her hand over my face so tight that I couldn't breathe. Is that true? Probably not, but that's how he remembers it to be. Somebody else puts their hand on his face and he reacts by kicking or punching or whatever because he remembered this and then he remembered that he ostensibly couldn't breathe from the faulty memory, which then causes the behavioral reaction. And then here you've got a car accident. I mean, if you've ever been in a car accident, this one doesn't look great. I mean, it's traumatizing on so many different levels. Number one is the life and death aspect. The number two is going to be the financial aspect of it. Number three, it probably wasn't even my car to begin with. It was somebody else's car. So, you know, there's a different, there's a whole lot of different layers and then untangling all of these variables and how it's affecting that person. So what was it? The oncoming vehicle? Was it the sound of screeching tires? Was it the smell of gas after the effect? Was it the pain? What was the variable that caused him to remember more than say somebody else who was in there? So as we start to look at the stress itself, what does it do for our memory? Well, one is the way that we form our memory. The next is gonna be how we retrieve the memory. So stress makes it really difficult to form short-term memories. So again, if you're trying to tell me about a formula for structures and I'm smelling a latrine, I can promise you that half of what you're telling me isn't even hitting my short-term memory because I'm like, how much longer do I have to stay in this room? Can I get out? Can't they do something about the smell in that red latrine? That's where my mind is gonna be. The next one is that stress can affect the transition of short-term memory to long-term memory. Did it get brought over in its true nature or was it distorted? Did you focus on something in particular? Uh, the entire semester that I was taking structures class, it was next to this latrine and it smelled the entire time. God, I hate structures. Structures really stinks. Here are the words that I use to describe it really stinks, which is the same as really smells. Um, the next one has to do with the recall of the details in the event. Maybe it was only one or two days out of the week, but you're remembering it as it was every single day and that class just went on and on and on, when in reality, the teacher probably let them out 15 minutes early every single day. So there's a, there's a distortion in the recall of that event. And then, of course, there's the tainting of the perceptions. You have somebody else who was taking structures class next to a rose garden, and it was always great. And they come out and they're like, oh, my God, I love structures class. Structures is such a great class. And they're like, oh, I hated structures. You know, it was just really stunk. Um, so then we go into the retrieval of our memories. And this is when present events are, dis are distorted by previous memories. So remember how I told you about the student who was using that stacking effect. So he was looking at driving to the museum. The drive was a horrible drive, terrible parking, more expensive. Those are all the negative aspects to it. Now, a year later, you tell me you wanna to go to a museum. Uh, I don't wanna to go to a museum because I had a bad experience. The previous experiences distorted my memories of the of the current or distorted my perceptions of the current and memory recall can be distorted way beyond what is true so one of the first things that i tell my students when when working with clients is it doesn't matter what is true or false it only matters what the client believes once I can understand what the client believes to be true, I can negotiate within that set of truths to try to get something that is closer to the actuality of truth. So how does this work? Well, it works first by taking a look at what memory is. So as I said, we have our short-term memory 
and then we have our long-term memory. Short-term memory requires something to be encoding to into long-term memory. It could be rhythm, it could be use, it could be function, could be just about anything that could lead into long-term memory. Now, the question is, does it get encoded into our implicit or our explicit? Implicit is unconscious, explicit is conscious. So when we look at the implicit memories, these are the things that are procedural. I walk into a building and I almost instinctively know where the elevator bank is. I've been in enough buildings that I know where it is and I can just go on autopilot. Now, usually there's some type of a priming that can happen. Now, I'm gonna talk a little bit about dementia and Alzheimer's here because there's a lot of people that are talking about the benefits of music and how when people start to hear music that they grew up with, which is the priming, that they start to, to dance or they start to, to react. And that makes the family feel good. And everybody is like, oh, it increases their quality of life. It doesn't. It doesn't increase their quality of life because they're on autopilot. It's very much like if you have a favorite song and you don't know the words. So you tell me what your favorite song is right now. And I ask you to sing that song to me. You can get some of the words. But once that's, that song starts to play, you can sing along to it because you've been primed. You've been primed to hear it. And so you can do something like, you are my sunshine, my only sunshine. You make me happy. It becomes a rhythmic part of, of our memory and it becomes procedural. So I can pretty much guarantee you that when I hit my, my 90s and I, and I have dementia, if somebody walks up to me and says, kingdom phylum, I'll immediately jump in and say, class and order, family, genius, species, variety, because I learned that in ninth grade. What it means, all of that, I don't know. But if you were to do kingdom bum, 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 phylum, do, 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 do. I already don't remember the next one. But anyway, you get my point. That's the priming because it's part of procedural. So when we have this routine or a habit, that's what we're really trying to form to create the procedural. And that helps us with wayfinding. That's where using case precedence becomes really important to start to see how people are using the same thing but altering it slightly different so that my experience is different, but the procedure remains the same. So that's implicit. Explicit is what we're consciously aware of. And here we're divided between episodic and semantic. Episodic is an event, an event that happened to you. Now you have to rectify that event with what you know, your worldview, what do you know to be true? And so if you remember, I talked about this particular image where you have spousal abuse. When we hear spousal abuse, nine out of 10 of us are gonna think men hitting women, right? But in reality, women hit men all the time. We see it on TV. I mean, they're constantly slapping men and it's okay. So it becomes a cognitive dissonance. How do we get from here to here? How do we negotiate that? How do I negotiate the fact that my primary care physician's office is in a houseboat? How do I get there? Because my general knowledge of the world says that my primary care physician is going to be in XYZ building. So you have to be careful in how far you go away from the norm before you start to violate and create a cognitive incongruence. Because I can guarantee you that the memory is going to fade away. So how does that then work? Well, we have our implicit and our explicit, right? And we know that explicit is part of semantic. That's the generalized understanding. And if you recall, I talked about that muscle car engine sound, that, brum, 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 that very, very rumbly kind of sound. We hear that 
and we end up with the expectation. We see this all the time with like, you know, the, the dog that's like, woo, 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 woo. and then you see a little Yorkshire Terrier come on out and we start laughing because it's incongruent and it doesn't make sense, but that will affect our, our memory. So here you start to look at how we're able to match the word car with the visual, with the sound. Now that is all found in the temporal, which is just, it's just the sides. It's these, 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 this part right here. Those are your temporal lobes, your parietals on top and inferior just means it's underneath the top. That's all, that's all inferior means. So that's where our, our semantic memory is, which means that I have to have neural connections between here, between the, the lower portion of the yellow to the middle portion of the yellow to the top portion of the yellow to the front. Now that can all be damaged from stroke. You could have had a disease like, um, like uh, encephalitis, which comes from West Nile virus. Uh, you could be suffering the effects of chronic traumatic encephalopathy. These are people that, that play football or um, American football, uh, we're seeing that, boxing, uh, other types of, of head traumas that, that people are getting. Or the dementias, those could be another way that could be uh, affected by this. And so we start to we start to understand the world differently and we start to cluster things in a different way because those neural connections are not functioning the way they should. Now if we're stressed out when we're when we're remembering, we may remember um, inaccurately because we're going to give more weight to one stimulus, than we are to the secondary stimulus or the third stimulus. So that's why we have to be, be aware of that. Oops. Okay, so again, here we go. We're looking at the episodic, which is in the hippocampus part of, of the recall. And this is the ability to recall the who, what, when, where, and why. So here you have this young lady who's talking to this guy about buying this particular sports car. And so she may come back and remember the event and say, oh, it was really wonderful. It was just such a great experience. But then it might be that she was in a war or something and she heard a lot of diesel trucks and usually the diesel trucks meant that there was artillery going on. And so now she's having this great conversation with this guy and it just so happens that a couple of diesel trucks were going by. And when she goes back to recall the event, that's what she's recalling are the diesel trucks, because now that has greater importance for her. So trauma can cause this episodic memory to fragment or it can cause it to fail. Fragmenting means we give lesser value to the important aspects to the situation that we had, as opposed to giving the appropriate or the expected um, levels. The amygdala is primal. So um, snakes and, and lizards, they all have this primal memory. And that's where we're gonna start to see things like emotions being recalled. So you may have felt the experience as being extreme happiness because I got a brand new car, but the next time you see the salesperson because you went back home and you recalled it and you were thinking about those diesel trucks that were going by and the rumble of it, you then think about how unsatisfied you were by that. And then all of a sudden you're not happy with a salesperson anymore. And that's what we start to see happening for people who've had trauma. And so we have to think about how these different environmental triggers are going to affect the person and how's that going to affect their emotion and their mood. And the last one that we have is the procedural. This is when we forget those steps we get very confused as to where we're, where we're supposed to go or what we're supposed to do. And that's where the rote memory comes into play. So we see trauma can change the patterns of this procedural memory and the person might become tense. So in the case of a person who, who thinks about an exam and then all of a sudden just the mere word of an exam, like you gotta take an exam gets them all stressed out and they start to, to tense up and all of a sudden they can't even remember their name anymore because they're, they're in this tense state. This will also bring you into the fight or flight. This is super, super important to understand because if you're designing a school 
or if you're designing a shelter for battered women or children or any of these types of places, you have to be aware that this fight or flight is likely to happen. Prisons are a great example of this. When designing a prison, you already know that the person's going to be amped up and it isn't gonna take much to get them over their stimulation threshold. And then they're gonna be reactionary and move into the fight or flight aspect. And that's when a dangerous situation can occur. Now, if you remember, I talked about the role of, of rhythm and I talked about the ability for use to be encoded. So here we have an interesting, an interesting um, design. And on the surface, we can say, wow, that's a really cool interior design. You know, I really like it. But when you go back home or you go back to describe it, unless something happened or there's something there, it's gonna be hard to recall the design itself and the memory of it will start to fade away and the key elements or the macro elements are gonna be the ones that we're gonna remember. The macro elements are either uh, displayed by uniqueness, use, or some type of an experience happening. So for example, they might, a person might forget that this living room had two levels down, so it was a sunken living room. But a person who falls down those, those, those stairs, they're going to always remember the sunken living room. And so they'll recall it 30 years later. Oh, yeah, I remember that living room was sunken. I was like, it was? Oh, yeah, you know what? It was sunken. How do you remember that? Oh, I remember because I tripped and I went down and I sprained my ankle and I couldn't walk for a week. That's the use. So as we start to look at these macro elements, these, the way that we understand macro is going to be subjective. A sofa, for example, might be that macro element. It may be that you have a person who loves to lay on a sofa. Well, you can't really lay on that sofa. Now, immediately that's gonna go into the visual perception. They're gonna be like, yeah, it was a nice, it was a nice living room, you know, it was designed okay. And like, oh, just okay, why? What was wrong with it? Well, I couldn't lay on the sofa. It was a curved sofa. So, you know, it was of little use to me. It was just a museum piece. And you've heard these words be echoed by other people. So that's easy to fix. You didn't have to have a curved sofa. You could have made that more, you could have made that sunken area um, more rectilinear so that you could make that happen. Or you could have extended it to make it longer. And so that's the use. The sofa is identified as the macro element for the person who likes that piece of furniture or likes to use that piece of furniture. The micro elements are those elements that come together that make you say, wow, I really like that environment. And they say, why, what did you like about it? I don't know, there's just something about it that I really like. It meant that there was a bunch of micro elements in there that you really resonated with. But if you don't have a lot of those micro elements in there, then you have, to, you have to rely upon the macro element in order to keep the positive perception. And that'll be the glue for the gestalt because the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. And you want to recall this environment in a positive way. That's the fundamental goal. So without the ability to attach an item to a concept, a memory, or some form of symbolic meaning, the memory itself will fade away. And you'll remember this for you know a week, two weeks, but it'll eventually fade away. And then you're, you look at it maybe a year or two later and you're like, oh, why didn't I incorporate that into my design? It was so cool. Well, because there's really not a whole lot that, that's descript about this. So the color is not descript. The lines are not particularly descript about it. And so you then have to look for function or use. So that then brings us to our supports and constraints. So first of all, we have our awareness. We understand now, we're like, oh, okay. Person may end up having some depression. We need to have a balcony because we need full spectrum sunlight. Natural sunlight isn't going to do it. Natural sunlight's great for melatonin, which is great for circadian rhythms. Does nothing for serotonin or dopamine. You have to have full spectrum sunlight and not a lot of it. 20 minutes, pretty good. 
20 minutes at seven o'clock in the morning, have your morning coffee out on the balcony, you know, take your 10 minute break, standing outside, you know, anything like that to get that full spectrum sunlight, because as we know, there are UV filters on our glazing, so you can't get full spectrum. So now that we know that, and we know that there's going to be some expectations, and there's going to be some things related to procedural memory, as we start to, to navigate throughout this, we can then start to say, okay, what's our expectation? Okay, I'm designing a school. Kids are going to be, um, have a lot of trauma. It's an inner city neighborhood, so you know, I'm going to have very reactionary kids. So that's the typology. So then I got to say to myself, okay, I've got these kids, they're reactionary, and they're going to be in the classroom, what's going to be their triggers, what's going to set them off. And that's where I have to use empathy. So when I have to try to put myself into somebody else's shoes, and use my imagination to say, how would I feel if what if somebody came up behind me with a stack of books and <laughs> slammed it down onto the counter? What's that going to do to me? Well, with a kid who has trauma, it's going to send them through the roof. They're going to have an adrenaline surge. They're either going to turn around, punch the person who did it, or they're going to run out of the room and they're either going to start bawling in the corner or they're going to become very agitated or, um, and irritated. That's where the ideating and the prototyping comes into play. Once you start ideating and say, oh, okay, this is what's going to happen. I can understand this because this is my population. That's when we start to design because we start putting the ideations together with what it is that we know. And then we start to, to develop the design itself. As I said, when I first started, nine times out of 10, I get students coming up to me, asking me to be on their thesis and they're already designing. And I say to them, what are you designing? I'm designing a homeless shelter. Well, do you know anything about homelessness? Well, you know, I know that, 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 that life's got to be difficult for them. I know that, that they don't have a place to live. Um, I know that they're probably alcoholics or, or drug addicts. I'm like, wow, those are a lot of assumptions. You know, have you ever tried to put your foot, your, your, yourself into their situation to try to figure out what's what and then try to design? We went to one homeless shelter where the beds were lined up where one person's head was right next to another person's feet. And I turned to my, my students and I said, you gonna sleep like that? Some stranger you've never met before, you're gonna sleep next to their feet? They were like, ew, gross, no. Okay, well, why didn't we think about that? That's part of the awareness, the empathy and imagination creating the ideations and prototyping so we can test them and then creating the design, not trying to force fit everything into an existing design. As I told you at the very beginning, it's my pet peeve. So sorry for my soapbox. Ah, okay, so here's an example. This was solar decathlon. This was for a person who was a returning war veteran who suffered from PTSD. So with our solar decathlon, it has to fit onto a flatbed. So we have this long, narrow um, place. So the first thing that we were looking at is orientation. Remember I told you about the site analysis. So I needed to know if there was gonna be direct sunlight penetrating the building from east or west. Now, in this particular case, we were able to determine where the building was gonna sit on the, on the site itself. So we had east and west along these edges here where there was no interior glazing, which meant that they were only getting indirect light. We maximized the southern exposure, which is this side, so that we could bring in more of the natural light. But we also created this area, which is a courtyard, but it closes up at night to transform into an atrium. So we can get exposure to natural sunlight by coming out into the courtyard or the atrium. The next issue that we had to worry about because this is somebody who's returning from, from the war suffering from PTSD, the big things that we need to be aware of are um, unplanned sound, usually kabooms or, um, or a, 
something that happened after something. So again, if you would hear like diesel trucks and then all of a sudden that was usually there was artillery that came after that. That's part of the procedural, remember? So we're, we need to take a look at those, those types of things. And then flashes from light. So here are there, are there automobiles that are coming forward, turning so that their headlights are flashing into the building causing a flash. So that, that determines our orientation, but it also then determines what we're gonna be using on, on the glazing to help prevent that. Now, we also want to create buffer zones as much as possible. And so we created some living walls. So this one here was a living wall. And then we put sound attenuating blankets in between the front part. So that way there we could reduce the amount of street noise. But look at how we designed the interior space. We segmented it. So here's where all the irregular sounds would be, which is in the kitchen. So blenders, garbage disposals, um, dishwashers, those types of things were all on this side. And then you had the television, which was over here. So in theory, he or she that is affected, their spouse could be in this room watching TV, but you got quite a, quite a buffer zone right here between there and the bedroom so that we could reduce the unwanted sound because this is now gonna be a dark environment. So now we don't have vision as an orientation. We've got the sound, which is the trigger to a behavioral response without the orientation, which is the vision. So if we look at our scales again, we're looking at sound being important. We're looking at vision being important, smell and taste, not so much important. But what we also have is the bedding and the bed itself because that's touch, but it's still pretty low. So that's why we created the, the atrium or the, the uh, courtyard that converts into an atrium at night. And so then this is more like the home office or, or a shed that, that could happen. Now it depends on whether the person is a night person or a morning person. If they're a morning person, then you would wanna have this be on the Western side. If they're a night person or a, a night person on the Eastern side, because you wanna make sure that the direct sunlight infiltration be aware, direct sunlight is a high stimulus. High stimulus because it's bright and high stimulus because it's hot. So that becomes something that we think about and that's where your sight analysis becomes really important. Now in Vegas, we also have to think about wind and what is the direction of the wind. Because if you've got this, this courtyard atrium all opened up and then you've got these doors opened up, we're all dust because we're in the desert. So the last thing you want is to have wind coming through into the, into the courtyard atrium and then polluting the rest of the, of the building. So that's why we would think, think of that. Now this drawing was done by Ryan, um, Ryan, oh gosh, I can't think of his last name. Ryan, I am sorry that I can't remember your last name. Um, this one here, was a school. This was a middle school, and this was done by Janet Roche and uh, Adrian, um, uh, Adrian and Nadia. We worked on this school here. Now this here is the counseling area because remember that kid that just freaked out because you dropped a stack of books behind them. Number one, as a design ideation, I dropped a stack of books, and I and I hear that sound. Ideation, put a rubber mat on top of the desk. Now I don't have that extreme loud sound. Uh, now I've just stopped this kid from going into an adrenaline surge. But let's just say that, let's make it a he, and we'll say that he went into an adrenaline surge. He ran out, he knew where to go. This is the counseling offices. Now you can see that it's all used with a uh, visual penetration. We wanna have visual penetration because A, if the kid becomes extremely violent, picks up the chair or, or whatever, people need to see so that they can help the counselor. And then B, because they have faulty memories, oftentimes they me remember things incorrectly or misperceive certain things. And so you wanna make sure that you have other people that can be witnessing what's going on. 
So the counseling area, you need to have that private space for the kid that is that is divulging things that they don't want their, their friends to hear about. But then you have the public space where you can just talk to somebody who's already de-escalating. And then this is the same space. Now this is where they run to. So here is the re-regulation room and I'll show you, I'll give you an example of that, but it's gonna be done by somebody else. But if they go into the crying mode, so if, they, if they're in an adrenaline surge, they may start bawling and they're crying so hard that they can't breathe, but they're embarrassed. So, you know, we put in the egg chair here so they can crawl up in their fetal position, cry. They can pull the curtain. They can calm down enough so that they can speak to their counselor. Then you've got the bean bags here. Now they can either lay under the bean bags because compression tends to help people feel better when there's a weight on top of them, or they can be on top of it, uh, on top of the, the bean bag and having that casual discussion. This wall over here is really designed to get people to open up. So I'm just coming down from my adrenaline surge. I'm upset. And so I'm just throwing stuff with my counselor at the wall. That throwing stuff at the wall is keeping my brain occupied so I'm not dwelling on what's going on. You've seen this in television being portrayed as a young boy who's throwing the baseball into his mitt over and over as he's talking to, to his father or, or whoever because it was some, I don't know, he did something bad and he's like, yeah, I know, I'm sorry about that. It's a way of fracturing the attention so that they can concentrate on what is important while dispelling the added energy um, that is related to the adrenaline surge. And so that's what, what we were doing there. This is a Velcro wall and they just keep throwing stuff at the Velcro wall and coming back. Now this image here was actually created as part of a project that I worked with Kendall Marsh at, uh, and Kendall Marsh created this image. And um, this was for somebody with chronic traumatic encephalopathy. Um, this is when people who are boxers or wrestlers or, or football players, but this becomes one of those re-regulation rooms. It's usually when somebody has that adrenaline surge and they've got to, they've got to like come on down. So here you can see the acoustical panel is being used throughout the, throughout the walls. So they can scream and shout or whatever as much as they want to. And then we've got this padded thing up here that they can punch and they can start kicking at it and that'll burn off the adrenaline. You've just got to let the kids burn off that adrenaline. And so you want it to be in a safe way to do that. But then when they burn it off, they're going to crash. They're going to come down to the other, the other side. And so here you've got the chair with the rocking motion. So it's suspended from, from the ceiling. So if it gets kicked or knocked around or whatever, but then the rocking motion will help to bring the kid back to equilibrium and back to balance. And so that was what we would use for re-regulation. Now, in order to get somebody to optimize de-stress and to relax and to um, encourage their memory, the idea is to bring in organic or rhythmic notions. Now, this is based off of the years that I've been doing uh, clinical hypnotherapy. And we've heard biophilia. And we say that, oh, if you get access to nature, that it'll, it'll, it has a calming aspect. That calming aspect has been great with kids with ADHD so that they can refocus their, their energy. I think that the reason why that works, and I haven't seen any studies on that yet, this is a great PhD for you guys that are doing your PhD, is to take a look at the rhythmic movements. And that rhythmic movement brings you into that relaxed stage. And so your brain waves, you have alpha waves and um, theta waves and beta waves in the brain. Theta is associated with deep meditation. So yogis who, who do meditation on a regular basis can go into theta and they're very calm and relaxed people. So the bubbles that come up from the, the fish tank or the sounds of that, that's a rhythmic sound and it's a rhythmic sight. 
the rectilinear is tried to um, be reduced through these wavy patterns because organic patterns allow the eye to continually move without getting fatigued. And so here, that's what this room was designed for. And again, this was done by Kendall Marsh um, at UNLV. So here's, here's what I'm talking about. Sitting underneath a tree, watching the leaves move, it's very rhythmic in the way that it's moving. If you could hear it, you would hear the sounds as well. Now, if I had a person with PTSD coming back from the, from the war, I might be a little bit concerned about directing their attention here because of the flashes of sunlight that came through. Those flashes of light can be a trigger for people who have war-related PTSD. But it's that type of, of movement that is important. And then if we go on to the next one, again, very rhythmic, calming movements. So I'm pretty sure that it's the sight and the sound of these rhythms that is the way biophilia works. But I'm not going to say for sure because I haven't seen any studies on, on that per se. So as we start to, to design the built environment, we've got to take a look what it is that we know, understand the biophysiological aspects, and then apply that through a layering process and develop prototyping. And from the prototyping and all that, that knowledge, that's when we can start to design. So design should be the end result so that we can have a better design. And so that is what I have for you today. You are always welcome to email me or to try to hunt me down online, which isn't too difficult to do and ask questions. And I'm gonna tell you guys what I tell all of my students. I get a ton of emails and if I don't respond, it's not because I'm ignoring you. It's because I may have overlooked you. So I never, ever, ever get annoyed with persistence. So I tell my students, call me, text me, email me, send a carrier pigeon, smoke signals, whatever it takes to get a hold of me, because I'm not ignoring you on purpose. Be persistent. That's what I have to say. There you have it. Questions, comments, concerns? Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kopak. It's a very overwhelming uh, lecture, actually. Um, <laughs> a lot of things. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> because, yeah, um, what my uh, perspective here is that, uh, you know, uh, we have a certain condition, especially when we are thinking about architecture, it's involved a kind of things, a kind of many things. For example, uh, if I'm talking about uh, the relationship between behavior and environment, we have to define our mechanism, whether we will focus on psychology, we will focus on physiology and so on. So that's yes, why yes. I think it's, it is important uh, for us to give the student for this lecture about uh, uh, architecture and behavior because, you know, uh, my previous master degree, I'm talking about, you know, thermal simulations, just like more, uh, physical uh, comfort, but here the psychological comfort is quite complex. As you mentioned before, we are not only talking about the human aspect from the uh, physical uh, aspect, but also the difficult part is about a uh, psychological aspect here that this is not our, you know, uh, uh, knowledge actually, because in architecture is quite a uh, many branch of uh, you know, uh, disciplines that we think about. So yes. when I read your books and I think uh, our students also overwhelmed uh, with this topic. So uh, you understand that um, I think for the last five years, uh, our students is quite uh, more interested with something uh, related to human, especially mm -hmm. for the, their behavior, their cultural backgrounds and social condition. And the problem is that we have a difficulty to translate all of that information into our architectural design. So that's right. why it's just like, um, you know, uh, so, so when our first beginning, I, I, I 
uh, uh, I told to my students that, okay, if you uh, attend this class, you have to be more careful. You have to be, you know, have a creative thinking or have a advanced knowledge about human and it's quite difficult for all yes. of us, yeah. So I can, I can uh, grab for all of your discussion today. It's not only talking about the uh, human aspect, uh, human conditions, just like, uh, for example, uh, personality and then age and then gender. But also you mentioned about some theories about uh, psychobiology, biology and perception, sensation. So, so, that's, so that's why I, I, I told you that this is a very overwhelming information. So we have to divide uh, which one that will influence our design or not. And I, I agree with you that uh, I think uh, most of our students always uh, study or uh, not always designing based on assumption. Is that right? Yeah. So I agree with you that uh, you have, uh, you give, you give, uh, you, you give, uh, what's that? Uh, a process that we have to include, for example, empathy, uh, mm -hmm. one a part of our concern about that, because uh, sometimes our students just like depends on the references, depend on the precedents, but I think getting in touch with uh, the people, the user, I think it's quite, uh, that's uh, very important, is that right? Okay. Yes. So, I, uh... Yeah. <laughs> So thank you very much for your uh, wonderful uh, lecture. So I will give a chance for our participant here to give, you know, um, question. But uh, Busara have already helped me to, you know, asking question in the chat box, but we haven't got any here in chat box. So uh, please, if any participant have a question, maybe you can raise your hands. So I will give you uh, time to discuss uh, the, the COPEC uh, lecture today. Okay. There are a yeah. lot of things to yes. consider. And, you know, all we can do is, is just keep trying, you know? Yes. As you should say, it's better to try and fail than to never try and succeed. So, yeah. So that's why this is not only a, a, a hard work for lecturer but also for students uh that <laughs> okay uh Bunufi, i think uh you 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 have one question or yes comments, Mar maybe yes yeah. marina i think i have no comments but i have a question so uh, dr kopek i find that the topic given today is very fruitful thank you thank so you. um i have one question um, what if the stress and trauma is being experienced in the long term? I believe that it would affect um, the way we use space. Uh, the problem I face when it's connected with design, I felt that there is a cognitive dissonance with the translating the theory into design. What is the best way to recognize the dissonance and put it into place? Thank you. Mr. I think I think a lot of that is is going to that burden is going to be placed on on myself and people who who take on this as a specialty, because I've been to a lot of presentations where I hear the people speaking. You know, case in point, I, I talked about the uh, inferior parietal lobe. I mean, what does that mean to, to, to an architect? They, they don't know what that is. It's our job to just simply, to, to break it down and say, this is the lobe right here. Inferior just means it's underneath. That, that's where it is. My job as an architectural psychologist and all the people who specialize in what I do, we have to bring it to a level that has meaning so that people don't shut down. And so even though, you know, the fact that you, you don't need to know inferior parietal lobe, but I shouldn't use my knowledge of like that to have you shut down and no longer listen to what I have to say after the fact. Does that make sense? So I think that that's, I think that's where the burden has to be in terms of, of long-term. Oh, I agree with you. You know, I think the long-term effects of this COVID are going to be, you know, amazing. You know, in, in just the community that I live in, we have to wear a mask, but the community next to me, which I can drive to or I can walk to, does not have to wear a mask. 
So, you know, there's already this, this disconnect between my community and the next community. Is that going to cause me or people in my community to be reactionary to people in that community? I think we're only seeing the tip of the iceberg in terms of the trauma and the stress that has been developed by, by the COVID. On top of that, you've got a lot of, of older colleagues of mine who are not adept at, at this type of, of technology and they're not comfortable with, with this kind of stuff and that places stress on them. So I think that we're gonna see a lot more of that uh, in, in the future. And I love the fact that you guys invited me um, to to talk to the students and I'm hoping that I'm hoping that I was able to to say things and and I know that it's overwhelming but I'm hoping that that it wasn't it didn't feel like oh god here's this this heavy duty researcher dude coming <laughs> over using all this big words that we don't understand and I got nothing out of it because I mean I'm hoping that you know you got a little bit <laughs> <laughs> thank you that, Yes, you're welcome. Long so, so Bunufi, Musada, I think we are very glad that we have already given uh, some chapter of the, the COPAC uh, books, especially for uh, psychobiology, yeah. perception and sensation, because, because you know, it's, I hope uh, my student can follow your discussion because we have already, you know, uh, read uh, first. And it's not easy, actually, <laughs> for us even for us uh, to understand about the content, something like that. Yeah, thank you, Gunufi. Right. There is a question in the chat box, Ibu Arina. Yeah, okay. So we have a very long question here, a <laughs> long, uh, long discussion. Uh, I think uh, this is from our, um, I think no fan is uh, from our, uh, what, what do you call it, uh, Busara? Alum, alum, alumni. Class. <laughs> yeah, alumni. Uh, he also uh, take our class, but he have already graduated last year. So we also invited our uh, alumni for attending this class. Um, he his name is Nofen, and I think yeah he cannot uh, open his mic, so I have to read it. So uh, see. <laughs> Seeing the examples you provided about the re-regulation room and all those beautifully taught aspect of a room, something came to my mind. Uh, what happens if someone with trauma or stress or memory issues got attached to the environment that is supposed to heal them, that they condi uh, condition themselves to not healing? So it's just like, uh, because, yeah, okay, not healing because they grew too attached to the said uh, environment. It's like what people uh, with depression feel from what I know, they grow attached to the sadness and they don't want to get better. Uh, is this a possible scenario and what should we do if this were to happen? So I think this one is the yes. human aspect and condition, right? Okay. It, it is a possible scenario. and. Mm -hmm. So the, the technical term is habituation. We habituate to our environment. Um, but really, what, is it, what does it mean? Another, another good word is called environmental numbness. So environmental numbness is when we stop seeing the attributes that we've added to that environment and their beneficial effects. So the best way to describe habituation or environmental numbness, imagine that you move into a new apartment or in a new house and you don't have the money to fix up the bathroom, for example. And you walk into it when, you, when you're gonna go by and you're like, oh, I hate this bathroom. You know, I think it's disgusting. I can't wait till, you know, I can remodel it. But then a year later, you've got the money and you can do it, but you still don't do it. It's because you've habituated to it and you've gotten used to it. And now you no longer see the negativity of that environment. That's called habituation or environmental numbness. That can happen if you design a space that is healing for a person with depression or anxiety, you know, the conditions that you're talking about, or even a person from PTSD, because they, they become so used to it that in order to have an effect, they actually have to change it up. If they become too attached and they, and they refuse to make the change, 
then it's kind of out of our hands. But if they really want to, to, to move forward with the depression or the anxiety or, or the trauma, they really want to, to get better and continually progress, they are going to need to have, they're going to need to change it up um, periodically. You can't stay the same. And that's what's really important. And I think sometimes we use the word that the person gets stuck. Well, when they get stuck, it's because they've gotten used to, they've gotten used to seeing it and they, and they can't move forward. So thank you for asking that question. That is a great question. Um, I don't think anybody's ever asked me that, but I love it. That's great. Well, Doug, do you think that's also part of the memories because um, you deal with the condition every day and then part of the procedural, it becomes a procedural memory, something like that? Uh, it, it can to, to some degree, um, but procedural is, is doing the same thing. So, you know, it, it's literally that, that habit. I wake up, I stumble, I go to the bathroom first, sure. then I go to make a pot of coffee. You know, yeah. that's, that's the procedure of it. For this type of a situation, what you're trying to do is to draw attention to the healing process itself. And if a person habituates or, or develops environmental numbness, they're not moving forward. And that's why I use the term getting stuck because you have to continually move forward because it's a journey. When you're trying to get out of trauma, I don't know that anybody is 100% ever out of it, but it's a journey that we all take. And the environment is only one portion of that journey. There's, there's the talk therapy and the stuff that you use with counselors and then the medical doctors will often bring about some pharmaceuticals that will help you with the process as well. But the same thing happens with the pharmaceuticals. I mean, you can be taking an antidepressant for, for years and it'll start to lose some of its effectiveness because the body just gets used to it. And so it stops working. The environment is the same thing. And so we have to keep, we have to keep mixing it up and changing it up so that you re, you're consciously aware that I'm on this journey and I'm trying to make this happen. I remember there's a Stockholm syndrome, I think they're called. Yeah, Stockholm syndrome? Yeah. That's when people start to affiliate with their yeah. captors. And so they start to see the, the good things about them and they don't see the negative things about them. So, yeah. So yeah, if we think, create a feeling- I think there's- strong, Oh, I'm just reading one in a chat that I'm reading from. Yeah, I, I think there's one question. Uh, is, uh, okay, Dika. Dika is one of my um, students for, uh, what's that? Uh, my, yeah, I supervise uh, her uh, proposal for final project, uh, uh, Dr. Kopek. So, uh, Dika, do you want to ask question by yourself or? I think it's better you asking uh, the question by yourself, right? Because I think your topic is quite complex. Okay, thank you very okay. much, uh, Guarina. Okay, uh, thank you for the topic for the lecture. I just want us if we want to create a feeling of trauma in space to recall existing memory. Can we also present trauma to people who don't have a memory of the trauma involved? Because not uh, not, not uh, some people have that uh, trauma, but we want today to know the trauma that uh, some people, uh, I'm sorry, because uh, Ms. Adina, can you translate this for me? Yeah, sure, of course, yeah. Oke, okay. uh, jadi terkadang nggak seluruh orang itu memiliki uh, trauma, tapi apakah bisa orang lain yang tidak memiliki trauma itu mengetahui trauma yang dimiliki oleh orang lain? Seperti itu. Oke, okay. so, um, you know, it's just like a quick overview, uh, 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 Doug, uh, because Dika want to uh, design a museum, uh, what's that, a museums? 
or community centers, something like yes. that, that mm -hmm. inform a specific message. So it's not only for the user who have a traumatic about uh, sexual abuse, but also uh, you know giving information for other people that uh, about the awareness about this abusement. So I think um, what we come in is that how to give an information through architecture uh, to other people who don't have you know abusement or that kind of uh, trauma, you know, so that they they can feel the empathy there by you know by understanding uh, all of things that happens in that uh, buildings. Mm -hmm. Can you get my? No, my I, I understand. What you're asking. Yeah, yeah, I understand. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I think, so there, there's two levels here um, that, that I'm hearing. One is for the person who isn't aware that yep. they've experienced trauma, but there's still a trigger. And so there's still, there's still a memory that's causing a trigger to a behavioral action that's going into the procedural memory. So that's actually very common with men because men are not are, are enculturated not to believe that they've been traumatized by something we're all supposed to be so strong mm -hmm. um so you tend to see this this happen where you have a trigger that trigger then causes a behavioral response this is where the empathy comes into play. And so if you can talk to the people, and in your case, DK, you're talking about sexual abuse in particular. If you can talk to, to the folks that have undergone the sexual abuse and just let them speak organically and, and, and ask them, you know, like certain things that were, that they went through and how did they interpret things, you're going to get patterns. Mm -hmm. And the pattern might be that that all of a sudden the room just felt darker or um, you're gonna hear through these stories. And this is where you would use um, ethnography is, is the research method. Mm -hmm. And you would ask them to tell you their stories. And then you're gonna start looking for commonalities. Once you see, once you find the commonalities you can make a list of those commonalities. And then in the programming spaces where you're trying to get treatment you want to avoid those commonalities. But in the areas where you want to teach people about others, you want to add those commonalities so that you can kind of create the atmospherics of what they felt for the people that you're trying to teach about it. Now, there is the danger because if somebody's in denial that they've had it and you put them into one of these spaces where you're educating, those atmospherics may trigger the trigger for, that they've had the trauma. Now that could be good because it opens up a door, but you've also got to be aware that there'll be a behavioral response to it. So you almost have to look at, at dividing the spaces into two different areas, one where the atmospherics promote it, one where you're removing the atmospherics that serve as the trigger. So does it mean that, um, you know, for, for these two kind of user, for example, one that someone who has a trauma, but the mm -hmm. other who has no trauma about it. So I think we have to, uh, what's that, uh, differentiate uh, the experience that, you know, that proposed for them. For example, mm -hmm. the one who have a trauma, uh, we have to be careful to understand about the sensitivity about their experience. So we just like giving them something, was that an atmosphere that comfortable at the first beginning. But yes. in the other hand, for the user who doesn't, doesn't have a, 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 was that, a memory of trauma, we can trigger them with the story first and then mm -hmm. trying to introduce uh, you know, the atmosphere, the things that they can you know, uh, try to uh, perceive what kind of things that they want to uh, experience is that right? yes absolutely yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. you know and even even in like the the first space like the lobby space you might use things like like statuary that creates mm -hmm. an affiliation for me who's been traumatized like oh i'm in the right place because i can see people like me in the statuary right. okay. but for me who's never experienced trauma to look at it like wow, you know, I wonder what that's like, 
you know, mm, okay. to have that kind of an experience. And that can be done through artwork, could be done through murals. Right. You know, and murals are great metaphoric representations within spaces mm -hmm. like community centers because mm -hmm. they're never, they're not usually direct one-on-one, -on -one, but right. they're emotive. You're trying to evoke an emotion to go into the implicit, um, implicit forms of memory. Right, right. So you, we, we can uh, uh, build stories, is that right? Depends yes, on exactly. depends on the users' uh, expectation and experience that we want to uh, yeah. propose for them. Okay, uh, Dika, is that answer the questions? <laughs> because I think we will have a, a whole year discussion before <laughs> uh, Dika graduated. But I think it is interesting uh, discussion. So Dika, you can email uh, Dakopek <laughs> one day. Okay. Yes. Yeah. To dis to discuss uh, more. Oh, sorry, sorry. Oh, okay. Sorry, I I unmute you. <laughs> Doug, can you just like uh, no no no? Can you uh, unmute again? Okay, sorry. It's just like that. Okay. Uh, so uh, that we have actually my invitation is only um until uh eight thirty, but now we are eight. We have running times eight thirty six. Is that fine if we extend yeah. a little bit? Oh, there yeah, yeah, are yeah. two questions, Warina. Yeah, because we have still have two questions here. Is that fine? Okay. <laughs> because I don't know, because you, maybe you have another class. Oh, no, it's it's almost seven, right? There's no class for you. But no. uh, actually, this, this class is until uh, 10.30. But no, I, I won't force you to stay with us until 10.30. But is that OK if we answer these two questions, the last two questions in the chat box? Please. Yes, yes. Okay. And I put my email in the chat box too for other people if you want to send me an email yes. and ask questions too. So I think that's know, it, it, sometimes, and maybe a question will come out later on today. So it's all good. Okay, thank you. Yes, I think that's a good chance. Okay, uh, we have Rani here. Uh, Rani, do you want to ask the question by yourself? Please, I think it will be good. If everyone not only uh, hearing my voice and uh, the corporate voice. Ah. <laughs> well, okay then. <laughs> Hello, um, uh, good morning. My name is Rani. Um, uh, I'm I'm from Penang actually. Um, live from Penang here. Um, yeah, I just um, want to ask. Do you know about the fourteen biophilic design patterns, right? Yeah. Um, regarding to that, uh, how many patterns actually should be applied to be considered as you know uh, as a safe environment or as can be considered as a good, friendly, you know, comfortable environment. That's the, you know, the more the better applies here or, you know, because there are 14, right? So is it, uh, if, it uh, if one, is it considered as a, uh, considered good or the more the better? That's a tough question. Um, so um, I'm, go I'm going to go out on a limb here. I have I have not been to Indonesia. My understanding of your climate is that it's more of a tropical climate with with a lot of rain. So your your um, norm for biophilic expectation is much higher than mine is in Las Vegas. In Las Vegas, we're desert and rock. So we don't have a lot of greenery. We don't have a lot of trees. We don't have any grass anymore. Well, we've got a little bit of grass, but not much. Um, but we're mostly rocks, mountain, and dirt. So our threshold is gonna be much lower. So when I go to Indonesia, for example, I'm gonna be on overload because you have smells that I don't have. You've got the, the, the textures from the, from the rain. You got the rain, you got the heat and humidity. We have heat, but I'm like being under a magnifying glass, you know, in, in, in the desert. So mine is gonna be at a lower threshold than yours. So that's where you have to take a look at your region and find out what's normal for them. I think in, in your region, I would, I think more is better for you guys, for my region, I would, I would cut them down because I would be looking again at my stimulation 
overload theories, stimulation and overload theory. That's that's how that's what I'm I'm basing this opinion on. All right. Sound thank good? you so much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Now okay, I got it now. Okay, thank you so okay. much. Oh yeah, yeah, you're welcome. Thank you. So it, does it mean that um, if we want to design something, we have to look the background of the user? Is that right? I mean, not only, well, yeah. You have to look at the background of the users, but more importantly, you really have to do your site analysis. You know, what right. is okay. your site like? You know, with your proximity to, to Australia, you could easily be designing in a place like Alice Springs, which is very different. I mean, Darwin in, in Northern Australia is going to be very similar in, in climate, I would imagine, is Indonesia. But when you start getting into like the interior or even the South, like, like Melbourne, because it's cold, um, you know, you're going to be looking to see, okay, well, what is, what are the norms there? So I think you're going to be looking looking at it. it's your site analysis to find out what your climactic norms. Okay, so the site is quite important. But what I mean is that uh, when you say that you live in a condition that you know the experience of greenery is not quite high, such uh, what we have in here in in Indonesia, I think it's quite different if we uh, propose a design for you. Because, you know, we can say that, uh, for, for example, uh, in your design previously, for example, if I see a pictures, this is not greenery at all. But I think maybe you can say that, oh, this is okay, because I don't have a lot of trees. I don't have, but here I'm, I'm living with a lot of trees. You know what I mean? It's just like uh, we, can, we can see the background or maybe the past uh, experience or the past uh, memory that they have. So we can adjust not only depends on all of the 14 patterns of the biophilic, but we can we can choose which one is the best for the right. user. Is that right? Yeah. And when I, I mean, when I first moved to Las Vegas and started teaching at, at UNLV, mm -hmm. the first thing that I noticed is that that those students, the students at UNLV, use lighting a lot more. I mean, it's amazing how much lighting is used in design as opposed to the natural. Yes, they'll, they'll have like living walls and, and that kind of stuff, but it's not, it isn't the, the organic use of, of nature in its curval, curval, uh, curvilinear forms or its three-dimensionality in, in shape and, and use of shadow. Uh, and that's just a difference because, you know, in Vegas, because there, there's a lot of rock and a lot of mountain, light is actually pretty intense. I mean, our shadows that we get from the mountains and the rocks are pretty phenomenal. And the way that that lighting um, affects the color. So I see, I see that with my designers when they're designing in class the heavy, heavy use of lights. And then when I go into like jury, jury reviews with local designers, I'm always hearing, we well, need to bring lighting in here. You need to up this lighting. So, you know, that becomes a, a major element more so than, than the, the full um, diversity that you experience in a tropical environment. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, okay, I hope uh, Rani, uh, that the COPEX uh, answer can give you quick. Uh, so, so basically, we try to utilize whatever we have in our surroundings. Am I right to say that? Yes. Yes, you want to analyze what you have in your in your surroundings and really start cataloging. What are your different sensory perceptions to that? Mm. Right. All right. Thank you so much. Sure. Thank you. Okay. Um, uh, we have a Givari. Givari, do you want to ask a question by yourself, please? Oh, Givari, are you there? I hope you are not the one who left <laughs> the meetings. Givari? Yeah, I think you... he, I think we, we can, oh, okay. we can uh, just uh, read Sarah, the questions here. Yeah. Okay, um, Doug, I think Gifari asked, uh, you've mentioned about how we should design based on a specific experience, uh, trauma, for example, but how do we uh, design something that will be 
um, a public uh, public for, for public experience uh, how to consider uh, people with for, for example if you would um, design in a public space mm -hmm. then you, you must deal with uh, a different experience yeah. mm -hmm. I think the question is quite the same with Dika, is that right, Dikara? It's similar. The difference that I think that she's asking is we have to design a lobby for everybody to use. Um, this is a lobby for a law office building. And now there's somebody that comes in with, with trauma. How do we, how can we try to minimize that? The answer, and, and if I'm if I'm interpreting that that right. When you start going for larger populations, so let's just say theoretically that there is equal probability that a child, mm. an older person, and an adult will utilize that environment in addition to equal probability that a male and a female will be using that and equal probability that we're coming from the same cultural and and religious background. The, the bar is so high that mm -hmm. you really have to look at what is the common variables. And so this is where that, that ethnography comes into play because the more specific you get, the, the larger your variable list will be. The more generic you get, the lower the variables will be. And so if I were designing a space like that, the big things that I would be worried about would be, first of all, surprises. So I would wanna maintain maximum visual access. Everybody can see around, there's no place to hide. Now, again, being in a tropical area, you guys are probably used to a lot of leafy vegetation that's inside the, the built environment. So I might need to, to shrink down some of my furnishings so that I can increase that visual access if you've got a large leafy plant that is next to that, next to the person. The second thing is, is I need to avoid any surprises. Surprises are the other big thing. And so a surprise can come from sound. So if there's the potential for cars backfiring, I'm gonna be using um, heavier rated glazing uh, on the front area, or I might be positioning the lobby towards the back of the building where there's less probability for external noise from coming in. Um, I'm probably gonna be looking at echoing and reducing the echoing because the, echo the reverberation can be part of the problem. Um, and then I'm also going to be looking at stability of lighting. So making sure that lights aren't gonna be flickering or that you're uh, transitioning from a very low lit area to a bright lit area. So I'm gonna be trying to even out the, the sensory, the sensory um, experience that a person has, and I'm going to be minimizing surprises as much as possible. Okay. Uh... Well, that's not easy to answer actually, but uh, <laughs> at least uh, we have a, a, what's that? We have a bright uh, comments from you. So this is a uh, last chance, uh, Dr. Peck, because um, I think one question, it will be fine. So we can uh, stop for uh, nine. Is that all right for you? Uh, no, you do not have to always consider a person to have trauma when you're designing a public spaces. So okay. you're only designing if the if the issue is to deal with people who have trauma. So a law office may be dealing with people who have trauma, a military recruiting center, a VA hospital. You know, you have to just use those spaces. So anyway, sorry, I just read that comment and I wanted to get in there. <laughs> it's okay. Look, we have two more people who raise uh, <laughs> their hands. Is that all right? Uh, that we uh, take again a question. Okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah, sure. We have Anas, Anas and three. Um, okay, I think Anas, you can go first, please. Okay. Uh, 
Thank you, sir, for the wonderful lecture that you gave us this uh, morning and evening for you. Uh, and I would like to ask, uh, I've been uh, reading and researching about hate-based violence and the trauma that, that they inflicted to groups of people. And I wonder if handling trauma is very specific uh, how do we handle if that trauma is inflicted to a group of people? Do we focus on each uh, personal trauma uh, that they uh, have within their themselves, or do we like generalize that trauma that they uh, go through together, and we focus on that general trauma? Thank you. I think when. That's a, that's a really tough one. Um, and the reason why it's tough is because the hate-based trauma is so violent. And the need to promote feelings of safety and security are probably, probably the most important. So you don't wanna have a truck driving into the building so you know raising it up so that your your um floor that that this that your trauma stuff is on is on is on a second floor can help that double skins on a building can can also help that but that's the empathy part that is actually almost a little bit easier to deal with than, than say the sexual abuse stuff because the sexual abuse stuff is a little bit more, more personal. Whereas the hate based is so violent that you can literally imagine, you can walk around a building, you can walk around an office and you can say, how can I be attacked? How can I be hurt? And that then can, can form your ability to, to design for, for that particular population. Should you be done, should all of that be there? Uh, absolutely. I mean, if there's a, if, if, if I've got a person there with, with sexual abuse trauma, I've got somebody there with hate-based trauma. I mean, paramount is to make people feel safe and secure. And I, I think that, that that would be another way. The sexual abuse one is a little harder because they're, it's so individual. That's where I would use the stories. But when it comes to the other, I think I would, I would do my own physical analysis of the building and the space. I would recreate it in CAD and I'd be like, okay, here's a weak point, here's a weak point. Notice how big this window is. You know, that could easily, something could come through that. So let's go ahead and let's do something with that. Maybe we bow it out. So, I mean, I don't know, but I would, that's how I would begin my ideation. But good question. Okay, thank you. And uh, after hearing what you said just now, uh, I wonder myself, uh, does this mean uh, exposure therapy is out of the question? Exposing the hate group to the other people or exposing the people to the people that hate them? What are you asking? Exposing, uh, so there's this uh, stra strategy that's uh, on my mind where uh, the people with trauma is faced with uh, the, Greek, the other people, but not part of the hate group, but have the same identity as the hate group. So uh, if we uh, do uh, like an example, people uh, that is very traumatized with, with Nazis, they are very traumatized with Nazis and they correlate German people as Nazis. Mm -hmm. And then uh, they have to face their daily life still staying in German. Does that mean that that means that they have to do their daily activities while doing uh, exposure therapy, little by little, because they have to face it every day. That's an, an interesting, an interesting um, analysis, uh, point of view. Um, well, first, so I think in terms of, of design itself, if you are, 
angered and you want to reconcile your feelings with quote unquote people that that you stereotyped as as Nazis the key is is to get to know them to realize that they're human too I mean that that's kind of the the key to to all of this is that we all have to recognize it doesn't matter what our what our cultural background is it doesn't matter if we're male or female it doesn't matter if w- what our religion is it doesn't matter where we live every one of us bleeds every one of us cries when when our mother or father dies um, you know we all have feelings and once we once we put a human element to the situation, and that's why I went to the artwork and the statues, because the statue or the statuary brings in that that human element that that you're a real person. I think that that helps. I, you know, I mean, I live in the United States where there's there's a lot of there's a lot of hate, unfortunately, in in my country, you know, and it's because we're so diverse that. There are a lot of people that haven't been exposed to one group or the other. Um, I have several. I have several really good friends that, after the 9/11 attacks, that were victims of that type of hate base because of the 9/11 attacks. I would not want to have them face the people who hate them. I feel like that would be more traumatizing. I would rather take the people who who are hating and say, hey, you need to get to know that these people are human and, and have it go that direction. Does that, does, does that make sense to you? Yes, thank you for the answer. Because if you're discriminated or beaten up or, or anything, and then you're forcing me to, to face that person to educate them, that just doesn't feel good. <laughs> Now I think you understand that our students quite, you know, we we are amazed with their creativity, thinking about social issue, personal yeah. issue becomes one of the problems that we have to respond or negotiate for the design. Is that right? So, okay. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, the Popek, we, ha- we still have one, uh, someone who raised uh, her hand. So I think this is the last uh, question that we provide. Uh, please, uh, Tri Okta, you can uh, ask the question. Mm-hmm. Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Kopek, for such a very good and interesting presentation. I would like to asking you. Uh, my question is something uh, related to post uh, disaster. Is such a uh, like a tsunami is a complex, right? Trauma, traumatical uh, issue. They lost everything. Uh, even though, for example, there psychological problem have been treated, their trauma still cured. Based on my friend's uh, experience uh, during uh, a chest tsunami. Yeah. Uh, how to deal with trauma in post-disaster cases? Is the trauma really uh, incurable? And what opportunities that architecture can offer to solve the problem? And the last is maybe you can give me suggestion uh, what kind of book that I, uh, I have to read, thank you, Dr. Kofi. So, so um, my, my understanding is a person who's gone through a natural disaster, uh, tsunami is your example, and they are now terrified of the tsunami and possibly being hurt again by that. Um, I can tell you from personal firsthand experience, because in 1994, I lived in Los Angeles and I lived right next to that freeway that collapsed. So, um, and I had to take surface streets the entire time, but the the trauma that we all felt at the end or or for, for a long time from that particular earthquake and then seeing the images of people in the collapsed buildings and being trapped in those, those buildings that we were all traumatized for a while. And when I say a while, I'm saying probably several years, but it does go away. And that's the beautiful thing about being human. And ladies, if you have children, you know this very well. Giving childbirth is extremely painful and you forget it and you are able to have another one. 
So that's the beautiful thing about the human experience when it comes to that kind of trauma is that it's something that we almost kind of expect. But I think that the issue is that there are probably some people who will now move, relocate. I mean, we had a huge exodus out of Los Angeles after that, after the 94 earthquake. There were a lot of people who moved out um, and people tried to reassert control. And so one of the factors when it comes to trauma in general goes into our, our sense of control theories which is part of the aggression frustration hypothesis. So the aggression frustration says that I'm in, I have no control over what I'm doing and it just gets me so spun up that I just, I, I, I just want to explode. That's, that's what part of that is. So if we can give, maximize people's sense of control. So I'm, I'm layering some of this because it goes back to the hate stuff, hate trauma, because we want them to feel safe. Well, if the fear is related to a tsunami, then being able to, to elevate them to a place where if something were to happen, that they would be in better shape. Now, after the Twin Towers came down in New York City, a lot of hotels were having a hard time renting out the hotel rooms at the, high, at the top floor because everybody was afraid that if there was another plane to go into a building that they wouldn't be able to get out and they would have to jump. But again, that's equalized throughout time. And so it's equalized in, in, in you know, with, um, you know, with time and, and experience. So I hope that helps. I don't feel like that was a very good answer, but it's the best I can give you right now. <laughs> You can you can too, you can continue asking questions. <laughs> yeah. Uh, back, yeah, in and in email maybe, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, you. Sorry for for uh 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 make you flashback. Oh no, it's okay. It's good. It's good. I mean it's those kinds of questions that make me think, and then I have to say, hmm, okay, let's just let's try to do some research and figure that out. Mm. And so whenever you look in, you were asking for books, you know, look for trauma-informed design. That would be one way to, to take a look at some of this stuff. But you just have to remember that trauma comes in all shapes and sizes. Mm. So yeah, so that's, yeah. Whole bunch of, yeah. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, that's that's why I think that uh when you when we learn about trauma, it's not always negative. I mean, no. you say that, you know, uh it means that we can more grateful for some things. So that's why it is important to be informed to other people so they can realize that, okay, I'm not in that situation. So that's why I have to be more uh, understand about something or something like that. Is that right? So I think that's yes. things yeah. that we can propose uh, through architecture, uh, mm -hmm. you know, introducing uh, someone else trauma problems that can build new understanding about the built environment. Well, and, and I think having a, a strong sense of reflection, you mm. know, just as as in um, in Tri's example of a, of a tsunami, I've never lived through a tsunami, but mm. in order to understand it, I had to think of something that I lived through that was equally as traumatizing, which was the 94 earthquake. Mm. So I can kind of relate to it, um, you know, differently because, you know, on the, on the other extreme, I didn't want to be at the bottom floor to have a building collapse on me. So falling asleep was always like, mm. you know, like, oh, what if there's an earthquake? And, you know, because, you know, so yeah. that's when you, you, you draw upon your experience. And maybe it's not even a one-to-one. -one. I mean, it just so happens that I went through a natural disaster, but, you know, I might think to myself like, okay, well, whatever, what happened if, I don't know, something else was coming through? How was I feeling about that? And that's the empathy part. Yep. Can, can I add something? So if we want to design something that want to other people learn from other people experience, so I think it's important to arrest a common understanding at the first beginning before mm -hmm. we introduce something that we can, you know, something architecture that can be experienced by that people. So they have a same perception, you know, uh, you know, same uh, stories that they want to experience with. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, because it's just like we open up uh, any uh, possibilities, people will perceive in a, into different things. But if in the first beginning we propose 
a certain uh, statement or certain certain uh, condition, maybe we can uh, you know adjust our uh, you know people can understand more about what is the goals of the design, something like that. Yeah. No, absolutely. Okay. And when we understand those goals, we do much better. So. <laughs> Okay, I think uh, that's the last question, uh, Doug, uh, and it is a very uh, great uh, opportunity for us to hear from you directly because, uh, you know, sometimes we are we're always wondering about ha having uh, a good literature, but we never know uh, about the authors, but this is, yeah. thank you very much for your kindness to ac uh, accepting our invitation, and I hope next time uh, uh, we won't uh, be able to come again if we invited you again and i hope it is not the the last but this is only the beginning uh, uh, for you <laughs> so i'm very honored i would be very honored yeah. thank you yeah. and i hope uh, today's discussion uh, will uh, give a new perspective and also uh, will give a new chance for our collaboration for the next uh, futures if yes, exactly. possible yeah Okay, uh, thank you very much for the times. Uh, so I think I have to end uh, this lecture. And thank you very much again, uh, Dr. Kopek, for your time and all of you who attend these uh, meetings. So I promise you that, uh, I hope you don't mind, uh, Dr. Kopek, that I will upload this lecture into our department uh, YouTube channel, if I believe, because we have a YouTube, uh, what's that, Musara, you call it? Uh, yeah we have we official have channel, yeah we have official channel. youtube yeah channel uh, so we will uh applaud this discussion so uh okay i think good night let the call back because it's already 8 uh, p.m right right there uh, seven, seven o'clock oh seven, seven o'clock so yeah so thank okay. you very much for your time and thank you very much all uh have a good day uh, i will close uh, this meeting assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.